Budget Council is. is uh, thrilled to host this event along with our cybersecurity peer group, which I will introduce in just a few moments. Um, this is uh, our panelists, which will, they will have an opportunity to introduce themselves in just a second. So we'll go ahead and go to the next slide, Emily. If you'd like to go ahead and advance to the next slide, Emily. Sorry about that. Deborah, can you share slides? All right, well, the next slide, we'll certainly talk about the New Mexico Technology Council. And uh, if you are not familiar with the New Mexico Technology Council, we've been around for 21 years now. Um, we were to celebrate our 20th anniversary last year. However, um, you know, uh, we had a logo designed with our 20th anniversary and due to the pandemic, we didn't do a whole lot of that celebrating. So you can imagine on the 25th anniversary, um, you will see quite a celebration. So again, welcome to our July cyber peer presentation. And for anyone who's not familiar with the Technology Council, again, we've been around for 20 years and we are a member-led organization focused on everything technology. And of course, I, all of you know, technology is in everything. So we have a very broad uh, focus. And as soon as we can get the, are you able to, to share the slides now? All right, bear with us one second. So Deb, you're on mute, so I can't hear you. <laughs> Sorry. There you are. Thank you so much, Deb. All right. So here's a little more about the New Mexico Technology Council. So this is our cyber peer group, but we also have a women in technology peer group that meets monthly, and we have a 3D printing peer group that also meets monthly. So if those are topics that are interesting to you, we'd love to have you join those. The best way, as Emily, I'm sure, is getting ready to put in the chat, the best way to keep up with what is happening at the New Mexico Technology Council is to subscribe to our um, events. And you can do that right on our website. Uh, just subscribe to our newsletter, or I believe Emily's gonna put right in the chat the link to do that. But that's the best way to keep up with what, what we're doing. We, we host two signature events annually. That's our Women in Technology. Um, and we just completed that a few weeks ago where we recognized um, seven outstanding women who, who have gone above and beyond in, in their careers. Um, and we will be hosting our Experience IT Conference this fall. And um, that is going to be in person. So we're all ready to go back to in-person events. So uh, we have a very strong policy and advocacy committee that's uh, keeping up with legislation that affects our businesses here in, um, our technology businesses here in New Mexico. And we're always looking for opportunities to promote our members. So you can go ahead to the next slide then. All right, these are our community partners. These are the folks who, who uh, support the organization. These, these folks, uh, we appreciate their support. They're the reason why we can do what we do. Um, and to continue to grow the technology ecosystem here in New Mexico. And if you'll notice, that slide has now gone to two pages. And we're just thrilled for the support. 
We have some upcoming events. Again, the best way to keep up with our events is to sign up for our newsletter and our distribution. But we have a Women in 3D Printing Peer Group. Um, they'll be meeting virtually July 14th. You can go right to our calendar of events on our website and sign up for that. Our big data and AI peer group will have a roundtable discussion uh, Tuesday, July 20th to kind of talk about what, what this group will be focused on for the rest of the year. So um, important discussion there. AFRL is going to host a virtual tour. So if you want to know more about AFRL, then uh, join our virtual tour on July 21st at 11 a.m. There will be more information about that in the next week. Um, our WIT peer group will be meeting in person at the uh, Fat Pipe location there at 200 Broadway on Thursday, July 22nd from four to six. It'll be a wonderful happy hour and we'll be visiting with our WIT honorees from, uh, from this year's celebration. And our August cyber peer group, we will have our own uh, Lenny Washington from, uh, from um, West Wind will be presenting, um, it looks like the title is Cybersecurity for the Edge, but I know he's gonna be talking about cyber related to your printers and your copiers. There's gonna be some very interesting information shared there. So we hope you'll join us next month, August 12th for our next cyber. Go ahead, Deb. Okay, this is the, the latest uh, focus for the De Mexico Technology Council, our experience IT. We are well into the planning, save the date. It'll be November 3rd and 4th. We'll host a VIP reception on the 3rd and a full day of, of speakers, and education opportunity, continuing education opportunities on the fourth. So continue to follow us for more information on that. Next slide. All right, we couldn't, this group, we couldn't do what we do without the support from our cyber peer group committee. And I just wanna call out and shout out to all those Venturize. He is our chair and he's with Sandia National Laboratories. Tony Carrado, who's on the call today, um, he is uh, always very helpful to bring uh, speakers for us. Sam Dickey's with Tech Systems. Mark Fidel is our cyber professional. David Kiston is also with Sandia National Laboratories. Lenny Washington, our August speaker, is with Westwind. And Dick Wilkinson is with the New Mexico Judicial Information Division, also our moderator today. And with that, I am going to go ahead and turn the presentation over to our moderator. Welcome, Dick. Thank you, Mary, and thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, I'll briefly introduce myself and then I'll turn it over to our panel members. They can each give their own um, short bio. Uh, as Mary said, I'm Dick Wilkinson. I'm the Chief Technology Officer for the Supreme Court and uh, the Judicial Information Division. As you can see, I'm wearing, I'm wearing my team colors today. Um, so I uh, am also a member of the cybersecurity peer group, and I just love having these discussions, bringing up these topics and hearing about how this is going to impact our community. Um, so with that being said, I'll go ahead and turn it over. Um, and if we could start with Raja, if you could please give us a short introduction. Thank you, Dick. Uh, so my name is Raja Simbendam. Currently, I'm the chief information security officer for the state of New Mexico. And uh, I work with uh, Cabinet Secretary Salazar and my peers um, in, in the department. So my focus has been to um, implement uh, the cybersecurity program for the state. And I'm new to my position and the program is new to the state. Thank you, Raja. Uh, and then could we hear from Orion? Hey, Dick, thanks. Uh, yeah, Orion Walther. Um, I have about 30 years uh, experience in the United States Air Force. I was recently hired to Deloitte in the government and public services section. Um, it's, uh, it's a phenomenal opportunity and uh, being able to apply all of the cyber stuff to uh, this new position I have and being an advisor for Deloitte is pretty awesome. Thank you, Orion. And then last is the person that I've invited to the panel today, Matt. Could we hear from you? <clears throat> sure. So um, I'm Matthew Freilich. Uh, I'm an associate director at Protivity. Um, I uh, work in the emerging technologies group, and I focus on 
um, offensive and defensive security for IoT embedded in medical devices. Uh, I've been with the organization for uh, about seven years now. And before that, I worked in offensive and defensive security for a large insurance company. Thanks for joining us today. And um, the, I, I invited Matthew because he had a very similar topic uh, and a discussion about the same thing about the executive order recently in a different forum. And I said, if he's already talking about it over there, then it'll be a breeze for him to come and talk to us about it. So thanks for joining us today. Um, with that being said, the, the topic that we've got up for discussion today is the executive order. And if you haven't had a chance to look at it, um, executive orders come out all the time, but they don't always uh, expect such a large and sweeping amount of changes or direct so many agencies to take so many actions. So recently the federal government issued the executive order. This has been about almost six weeks ago at this point now. Uh, and it really was a rundown of every aspect of cybersecurity and IT management that the federal government and the White House specifically thought needed some attention. This was in response to uh, obviously some high profile recent cybersecurity events that have happened. Uh, you know, it doesn't take long to even top top level CNN front page national news is starting to get cybersecurity uh, events breaking those headlines. They've now crossed over to be nation state and even international foreign policy level events. So it's extremely critical that the White House has taken the lead to tell every federal government agency how they should behave and how they should start to shore up these gaps and these problems that we have. There's even some information in the executive order that compels industry and government to work together. So we're going to discuss some of those uh, effects today of how it will impact our local government agencies here and how the industry in New Mexico is going to respond to these executive order changes. So with that being said, we're going to start off with Raja and we're going to talk about um, how a federal government policy change like this might impact decisions that state and local leaders make. So Raja, let me give you the formal question here. Will the federal shift to mandating more security input from their vendors be reflected in any changes to state policy, specifically coming from your office? Uh, I would, um, I will, I'm inclined to say yes. At least uh, um, uh, for discussion purposes, there's one thing that uh, that's on top of my mind is the vendor risk assessment, right? The supply chain risk has been specifically identified in the executive order under a specific section, right? So it has its own presence in, in a uh, sweeping executive order. So that uh, vendor risk assessment is going to get a lot of attention, in my opinion, because the supply because of the supply chain risk that presents in the environment. And um, um, I'm not sure uh, how robust or how mature many of the institutions' uh, risk assessment process are. Uh, I'm talking about the audience here, so. Um, the state has its own uh, risk management processes in place, but uh, definitely we'll be looking at um, improvising or strengthening that uh, to address uh, vendor risk management. And uh, um, one of the sections, I believe it's section seven, uh, it talks about vulnerability management, right? And the state has been focusing uh, very much on vulnerability management uh, through an independent third party service provider and has been strengthening that process quite a bit over the years. So I'm happy to say we do have a very mature process and uh, we are going above and beyond uh, the typical um, uh, duration for a vulnerability analysis. Uh, gone are the 90 days, uh, but due to the sensitivity surrounding what we do, I cannot uh, go much more into details, but uh, we have gone past the 90 days. Uh, we are not doing that anymore. So I'll share with our audience, um, Raja and I, you know, we uh, work together and the program that he talks about, you'll be all be glad to know that the courts participate in the same program. So we have that same level of vulnerability inspection in our systems, even though our networks are completely separate. Uh, we take advantage of that same resource. So yeah. um, we Man, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, <laughs> Dick. Um, one of the thing is uh, the program that I'm referring to covers all three branches of the government. So not just the executive branch where the uh, agencies that provide constituent services come into play, but we are talking judiciary and the legislative branches of the government as well. 
Yeah, I think that the note there for this group is security is one of the only places where we really completely cooperate and do everything we possibly can to be in step with each other. Um, so that's, you know, we see the value of that. And as security leaders, we don't mess around there. So thank you, Raja, for your support. Yeah. One additional thing I want to add to your question, um, uh, Dick, is uh, uh, while the policy has come out, uh, the executive order has come out like um, around mid May time frame, uh, they are still working on regulation and finalizing some rules associated with that, right? There are, if you look at, if you have the time, please take a look at, uh, read through the executive order. There are multiple nuances associated with it in defining you know, working with the OMB or working with the Secretary of Commerce, they are going to issue rules and regulation that's going to follow, right? Because the the extent of the executive order is so broad, um, it combined many of the pre-existing uh, uh, processes uh, within the federal government, right? It talks about cloud, it talks about supply chain management, uh, it talks about communication, it talks about sharing of um, information with the uh, uh, state and local territories, right? So, so many things did exist in practice in some shape or form uh, in the past, but they are trying to bring them all together, make it much more comprehensive, give a more holistic approach to this. Absolutely. That was the thing that jumped out at me the most was just how in-depth and sort of broad sweeping this was. So another avenue that's covered in the executive order is, as Raja mentioned, is the uh, information sharing. And to some degree, what we've the headlines have compelled us to understand is that threat information is really critical. So Matthew, if we could talk to you a little bit about um, the executive order calls on more partnership between industry and government, especially for sharing threat information or for vulnerability research like you do. Um, do you think that device manufacturers will be hesitant to share or are they going to be eager to comply in this new kind of security framework that the government's putting in our lives? So this is a really good question. Um, and uh, so I think we're going to have device manufacturers that are on both sides of this fence. Um, some will want and appreciate guidance from the federal government on things like the, the types of information that they should be gathering. Oh. Okay, sorry, I thought I was on mute for a second. Um, the, the standardized formats for the, the, uh, the documentation uh, and for threats and incidents, uh, and uh, it will also help them because there will probably be um, uh, minimum retention policies that can be established by the federal government that can be followed by uh, not just uh, the device manufacturers, but also lots of organizations. So there can hopefully be like this base minimum, a foundation by which we all agree for a lot of these types of topics. Other manufacturers, though, might find some of the requirements really burdensome. And uh, it's going to be very interesting to see how the industry adapts to this. There's definitely going to be companies that are going to uh, have niches that they fill as a result of this executive order to help other manufacturing companies kind of deal with these new requirements. So some of the things like um, manufacturers must identify the points of contact with each federal entity that they sell or provide technology services to and for, uh, they, depending on the types of services they provide, uh, they'd be required to implement new and more robust security incident monitoring technologies, which will be very interesting. So uh, when you think about a device manufacturer, a lot of us just think, oh, you know, Philips makes a hue light bulb that, you know, we can control from our phone or something like that. What, what we don't oftentimes think about, though, is usually these same manufacturers are supplying you with the application on your phone, the web uh, API that they interact with, the cloud infrastructure that this stuff is designed to work with. And uh, if you sell these items to the federal government, these kinds of things will likely start to fall into scope for this kind of stuff. And as a result, they are going to have to have this robust monitoring and incident uh, uh, capabilities for all of this infrastructure up and down the stack. Um, some of the product makers could be required to implement threat monitoring capabilities that enable direct collaboration with the federal government, as that is mentioned in the executive order, which might mean that uh, systems will have to be designed in a way so that you can share what is potentially the most sensitive data in your infrastructure, vulnerabilities that might exist or whatever there might be, very easily, simply, and quickly with the federal government. So 
those kinds of situations or those kinds of environments are going to have to be set up in a way uh, that is conducive to this kind of information sharing. And uh, there's also requirements for quote unquote prompt reporting uh, of incidents and not just incidents, but potential incidents, which means that if there is what we think might be a breach or uh, a device manufacturer might feel that there is something that is out of the ordinary, that is, uh, you know, there could be a problem with, very quickly, they're going to have to be able to make decisions and figure out who they need to be contacting in the federal government or other governmental agencies, what they're going to be sharing with them. Uh, so there's going to have to be new lines of communication established, opened, and practiced so that this can be done effectively. Uh, I, I think what I hear from your answer there is a lot of new stuff, right? A lot of new processes, business processes, possibly even technical tools that maybe don't exist right now to help share that information. So um, I think that you know, it sounds like a lot of work. <laughs> it definitely um, will be, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And I can see why different uh, companies might have different responses to that. Uh, some people are going to be all about it and some people it's just going to be a really serious, like you say, burden. Um, let's, let's consider the local market and some of the customers that are here in New Mexico. Um, I know that we're all tuned into this, you know, the executive order didn't exactly break those headlines like I had mentioned, um, but we all caught wind of it. Not everybody has though. So Orion, if I could ask you from the consulting perspective and the clients that you're working with here in New Mexico, um, does your consulting firm expect to see major changes in the types of questions that your customers will be asking? And have you seen any of them already uh, start to talk about the executive order or ask any sort of preparatory type questions like they're making a strategy decisions or anything like that? Yeah, I think the answer is a resounding yes on the first question, because um, as the federal government executes this order um, and trickles down, uh, those questions will keep popping up. And, uh, and, and, and like you said, we're six weeks into this. I think that's... Uh, you know, looking at the executive order and how extremely aggressive the timelines are, um, it's getting attention. I think it's kind of ramping up. So um, from our perspective as, um, you know, as Deloitte, as we get uh, requirements that come down to the government to us uh, and then also to our clients, um, it's going to be very, uh, it's going to be very interesting. But when you consider things like two-factor authentication and data at rest, you know, encryption, these are items that have to be addressed. And if we're not addressing them, then that's going to cause some issues for especially small businesses, any organization that wants to do work for the government, um, they're going to have to, uh, they're going to have to implement. Um, that's just, that's just the reality that we see. I mean, clear defense contractors historically, uh, if not the highest, one of the highest vulnerability points for the federal government. So uh, just a couple of thoughts uh, there. Um, and I think I'll, uh, well, and another thing too, when you talk about sharing, that back to the sharing discussion, um, it's one thing to say share uh, when we're talking about data, organization sharing data. I mean, we'll go back to some of the Intel stuff I have experience with, um, with a terrorism act that said, hey, you guys will share, but it's another thing to implement that. There's so many mechanisms that have to be in place, uh, considerations for that type of work. And so for the federal government alone, it's, it's a lot. So I heard a, a little bit of a theme from all three of you in your answers, which is that there's an aggressive timeline built into this executive order. I took the very same kind of reflection when, the, when I first read it was that I was seeing numbers of days, not numbers of years <laughs> that these things should be completed. And there were, you know, 180 days, 270 days. They're very specific. And for the federal government to do anything in six months is, is just, uh, <laughs> you really got to light a fire and pour money into the fire to make that happen. Um, so, you know, I saw those timelines and thought, okay, I like that the, the, bar has been set, but I think we all understand that some of that just won't be able to happen in that timeline. So with that being said, if we think the executive order is very aggressive, I'd like to hear from each one of you, how much confidence do you have in that timeline as far as the industry in general being able to respond? And then do you see any impacts to the timeline that may affect how you do business? So we'll start, we'll just, uh, we'll go backwards this time. And Orion, if you could kind of tell us what's your confidence level in some of these timelines? Well, um, I think historically, looking back, like I was mentioning, you know, Counterterrorism Act and all the things that were uh, that were recommended out of that, and how long it took to implement, and some of it never was actually implemented. Um, now I'm just throwing that out there. That's uh, just something to consider. Now, from our perspective, Deloitte, we will do our best. I think that um, we're confident in how 
um, at least in, from a procedural standpoint and, and how we would address it from a plan perspective, yes, we will be able to do it. Um, a lot of complexities, a lot of things to consider, um, a lot of, uh, I mean, again, I keep talking about like, you know, two-factor authentication and all these things that will have to be uh, done. Um, it takes resources, it takes time, and it is a complex effort. So, um, but I think, I think it can be done. And um, just from, from our perspective, we will do absolutely the best we can and we'll not ignore it because it's important as you pointed out at the very beginning of this discussion. It's something that has to be done. Um, how it is actually executed, um, you know, there may be some changes. There may be some timeline adjustments uh, once things kind of come to reality, uh, but that's just a theory. Matt, what's your confidence rating on these timelines? So I would say that there are some elements of it that I do fully expect the federal government to be able to achieve, uh, although I, I do agree with Orion that some of the more complex aspects of this are um, likely not feasible in, in some of the aggressive timeline that they've provided. But I will say, so they have already achieved some of the basic mile markers. So at within 45 days, they've already published the critical software definition. Uh, by July 11th, we have an expectation that they will publish minimum SBOM elements. They're working with industry groups, OMG as an example, uh, to try and ensure that there is uh, agreement not only from the federal government's perspective, but the private sector, which I think is critical for something of this nature to, to be successful. Um, and then there are some things that are just purely in the federal government's hands that are not particularly complicated. It just has make sure making sure the right people are in the room to figure it out. So recommended language for FAR and DFAR contract language updates is required in the next four days. Uh, publishing the minimum standard for um, source code testing is also expected by July 11th. And uh, this is something that companies like Deloitte, uh, companies like mine, Protivity, and, and lots of other organizations have been doing for you know, over a decade. So there's a lot of very well-worn and understood uh, and established standards that can be used as this benchmark that the federal government can adopt. Um, I think that some of the cloud strategy, which um, for anybody that hasn't had an opportunity to really go through the whole executive order, a huge portion of the executive order is actually about cloud and zero trust architecture. The federal government wants to push as much technology as possible and infrastructure as possible into the cloud, which means that there's going to be a lot of money available for it, which means that the private sector is going to figure it out as rapidly as possible to try and achieve and work with um, you know, the federal government. So um, I think that is very aggressive to try and get that done, uh, at least understood well within 90 days, um, but I, it's potentially possible. And that's with the backdrop of the Department of Defense completely scrapping the Jedi contract where they thought they had their cloud, you know, ready to go. And now they're back to square one and they're going to start again. So, <laughs> but everybody else better get on board, right? So Raja, uh, I'll turn that over to you. What's your confidence? And then another question I had for you specifically that kind of dovetails from our first one is, um, how quickly do you think you would see any impacts to your policy changes? But we'll start with your confidence. And then if you have any insight on that, you know, we'll go from there. Sure. Yeah, I would uh, tend to agree with uh, the previous two speakers, Matthew and uh, Ryan. So um, it, it, the way I see it, you know, my optics may be a little bit different uh, having worked with some of the federal agencies uh, here in the state, I see some similarities, right? Uh, in the past, uh, the feds took a data-centric approach, right? Based on the sensitivity or the classification of the data they had some maturity uh, in some of the organization and not so um, in other organization. Like for example, having dealt with Homeland Security, the federal Homeland Security and IRS, um, I know how robust some of their practices are. Reading through the executive order, they have many of these factors already implemented into their day-to-day -day practices. You cannot operate an IRS agent laptop without multi-factor authentication. So these are, you know, in terms of the maturity model in some of the elements that they have gathered here in the executive order, this is bringing like a streamlined approach across, like, you know, for all agencies to follow, right? Because if you look at it, there is no clear data classification, anything in reference to that, right? But they want to take a more broader approach across the ecosystem so that the risk is um, mitigated appropriately, um, you know, 
Now, it, it's not lopsided saying like, oh, some of the mature agencies, including the Department of Defense, uh, they protect data much better than like maybe Commerce Department or FTC or things of that nature. So I think this is bringing some uh, uniformity and standardization across the federal IT ecosystem. Uh, very similarly in the state too, right? Um, you know, the maturity model is a little bit different, right? You know, some of them are with the agencies that are much more compliance oriented because of the federal data usage within the state ecosystem. Uh, they are a bit more mature in terms of their processes and their understanding of some of the critical controls, either the CIS controls or NIST. Oh, and by the way, the state subscribed to NIST 800-53 framework, right? So this has been in process for a while. So many of the elements that they talk about and you know, even the guidance in the executive order points to NIST working with uh, some of the uh, cabinets to provide them the guidance. The, the farthest that I saw in the executive order was 270 days, right? For NIST to provide some guidance, right? In, in terms of publishing best practices, things of that nature. But um, the, 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 as I said, you know, some of these processes are gonna be uh, interesting uh, because uh, they started with cloud first, right? Moved everything to the cloud. Now they modified after seven, eight years, they modified their approach to say cloud smart. Uh, they are still figuring out what, you know, how smart the smart should be, um, uh, depending on you know what are the things that they can push out. Um, and many of the agencies, you know, Ty, you know, in reference to what Matt was say, talking about, the FedRAMP has been in place, right? Most of the agency that uh, deemed their data to be uh, sensitive or that requires the extra layer of protection, they already moved to the government cloud or uh, a FedRAMP certified model cloud. Right, so those things are already in practice. So the, once again, as I said earlier, this is just bringing some standardization and uniformity to the process, <laughs> so that the entire federal ecosystem can be better managed. And the reporting, right? So they didn't have a good reporting mechanism. We all know what happened with SolarWinds, right? December was a hectic month for many of us here, as well as for folks. Uh, I feel for my brethren and the federal government. Some of them didn't know whom to contact, right? They didn't even have CISA's contact information for them to react to. So, uh, so they are planning to improve the coordination in terms of incident reporting, things of that nature. Uh, so that is my take on um, your question in terms of how soon some of these could be uh, implemented. The agency, uh, once again, funding, I think is going to be critical. Uh, so far, based on my understanding, the 600 million that was allocated to Homeland Security for cybersecurity, um, efforts uh, is all I know about. They are still issuing guidelines on that as part of the ARPA funding. Uh, um, so there's more to come, right? I do not know how DHS is going to divvy up that 600 million. And if there are any other funding sources from the 2 trillion that, uh, that was um, um, allocated, right? They, it could be for recovery efforts, like meaning disaster recovery efforts. Um, you know, strengthening up the controls in terms of availability, thanks to the pandemic, right? Many people are dusting off their DR plan and bringing them to focus, right? Um, people thought it was an administrative task and it's a pain for them to maintain business continuity at disaster recovery. Uh, but reality is different, right? If you do not have a good business continuity or a disaster recovery plan, uh, I'm pretty sure the pandemic uh, you know, would have created some additional issues for you, right? Uh, additional headaches. So uh, these are all lessons learned. Once again, I think the agencies would be in a better place to do that. The additional funding to CISA and other organization in terms of pushing the agenda forward um, within the federal government, it's going to take some time, definitely. Uh, I'm, I cannot predict the timeline, but uh, sooner um, than earlier, right? So definitely in the past, they have taken their many time to Im implement the control frameworks, but now I think it will be on an accelerated time frame for them to get the agencies that require the attention. So that is my take on it. And uh, you had a follow-up question on policy. So can you please- um, No, that? actually you kind of covered it there in, your, in that last statement there of kind of how quickly do you see some of this happening? Yeah. And uh, great, to, uh, kind of refreshing to hear Raj just say the feds are, are more than halfway there on a lot of this stuff. So don't fret. <laughs> the other half is not as daunting as it seems. Yes, the, the agencies typically that uh, holds a lot of the 
what I would call it constituent data are user data that is considered sensitive, sensitive, right? If you think the passport system is going to have the, these pain points covered now, uh, no, they have that taken care of, right? Same with uh, the, uh, the revenue collection, the judiciary, et cetera. They have their uh, critical systems all covered, right? Once again, um, depending upon the approach, right? If you're looking outside in or inside out, right? So they can have different methodologies to address it. And uh, some of the agencies use DISA sticks. Even here in the state, they use uh, DISA sticks, right? To control the perimeter devices so that they have better level of protection and then slowly work the concentric circles of security. So we've got a couple of good questions from the crowd um, in the chat. So I'm gonna try and work a couple of those in here. Uh, and Matt, you mentioned something earlier, and it's a phrase that I think some of our listeners may not be familiar with, SBOM, which is Software Bill of Materials. Uh, and so we got a question from the crowd and it says, any thoughts by the panel? So I'll give this one to Matt on implications for use of open source software in delivering to the federal or other government parties. Um, I'm sure there are folks here that develop software tools or that develop um, different services that may be built on open source underlying code. So what's your thoughts on that? And how does that, uh, how does that kind of fold into the SBOM that you mentioned earlier? Sure. So just Quickly, the, the SBOM, so Software Bill of Materials, effectively it is, the expectation is that, uh, based on what is written in the executive order, that uh, any software, uh, and this includes software for like a mobile application or a web application or the firmware inside of a device or, or anything software or firmware related, um, uh, will have a list of all of its contributing components. So there's the custom software that's written by, you know, a, a company for what they're doing, but it's also the contributing software to that. Do they have open source libraries in there for cryptography? Um, or do they have other components of software uh, that are, you know, from other groups? Every single one of those components must be listed and available upon request uh, by the government. Now, uh, this has a couple of very interesting implications. So a large part about open, open source is that uh, anytime you use open source software, depending upon the licensing, you either have to have uh, and include that, uh, you know, this software or this open source item is included in this application. Um, if you make, as a, as a software maker, if you make modifications to it, you must make those modifications public in some instances. Uh, and there are a, there's just a lot of potential contributing factors that deal with open source, and it is very integrated into our lives, whether or not we realize it. You're, if you have a Samsung smart TV, there is open source in it. If you are using a lot of uh, embedded HVAC systems, there's usually actually open source components in there. So the executive order is saying you must provide a list of all of those components um, if uh, uh, upon request by, by an agency. Now, the reason that's important is if there is a known vulnerability for any software package, whether it's open source or not, and it gets published in something like the National Vulnerability Database or uh, some other vulnerability database, um, it would be good for an organization to be able to very easily and readily say, oh, hey, we have a device in our network that has this vulnerability in it. Um, the vulnerability is something that's accessible over the network or something else of that nature. Um, we should potentially try and isolate this device from the network that we currently have it on until there's a patch available. Or you can know to reach out to a, uh, a developer or the manufacturer, whoever it might be, to get a patch for that application. Now, strictly speaking about open source, uh, when I was mention mentioning earlier about uh, the licensing that is involved with this, Lots of device manufacturers and lots of just manufacturers in general, for better and for worse, have either included that they are using these kinds of open source libraries because it's required in the license, or they've completely ignored that. And they actually have no idea what the requirements are as a result. So the GNU license, as an example, says you must say that we that this application or this portion of code is from an open source library. Um, so what's going to happen now is these device manufacturers are going to have to inventory 
every contributing piece of code in their devices, in their applications and everything, if they want to sell to the federal government. And this has a lot of potential issues because companies might have a situation where they have a piece of code in a device or in an application that's not allowed to be there. So there, there's a lot of, 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 of question about what is this going to do? How are we going to do this? What are the potential implications for our businesses? It, it's, th that will be something very messy and I'm very interested to see how that plays out. Thank you for that. Um, Orion, I've got a question for you. And um, this one's gonna get to a little bit to the cost of what some of these impacts might be for our local businesses here in New Mexico. So I wanna do a little bit of a comparison here. If anybody here may already be going through or have considered um, CMMC audits, right? So contractors that wanna do business with the federal government are now being imposed upon to do all these administrative audits to make sure that they're following certain um, security procedures. Well, this executive order is uh, very similar to that and it's very directive. Uh, so let's do a comparison. The cost to get that CMMC audit has gone up and up over time. There's more and more uh, kind of requirements built into it. And a lot of companies are starting to look at that as a, as a daunting um, issue to deal with. I see this EO executive order having similar impacts. So my question to you is, I've heard that the cost of a CMMC audit is essentially getting out of control for some smaller businesses. Does this executive order lay groundwork for any programs that are going to be a surprise cost to the average small or medium business? So how are you know people that aren't the big heavy hitter DOD deep pocket folks going to deal with something like this? Yeah, I think a couple of things there. Um, I heard a figure recently uh, from the New Mexico CIO, something like a billion dollars, uh, a billion dollar price tag. That was something that was announced or reported somewhere. So this, you know, just to put into perspective, what kind of cost factor we're talking here uh, to implement, to get into compliance and to, you know, become up to date, right? If you just want to say it that way. Um, my thoughts on how small businesses are going to have to approach this is they're going to have to potentially partner. Um, there's, uh, you know, power in numbers in this case where there may be a way, uh, whether they set up some type of uh, group to collaborate, um, to address the issue in a, in a collaborative way and in a, in a way to cost share, because some of these things may crush a small business just in one swoop, right? So one thing to implement may, may take their bottom line way out. So I just think that, uh, you know, I think we, we, would, we would be strongly encouraging small businesses to form an alliance in some way, shape or form to try to meet compliance uh, because, Individually, uh, solo, I, I, there may be, there may be very little, little ability to do so. Thank you, and I have, uh, I see someone put some information in there about CMMC in the chat. I knew I was leaving uh, some details out there. I was just making a hopefully a hopeful assumption that most of our audience had at least heard of it, if not already maybe engaged with it or been put through some of the ringer of it. Uh, okay, so I've got another question from the audience here. And uh, let me see how I want to offer this one. So there, the, the question is, how can New Mexico position ourselves to be leaders in security rollouts? So, uh, and then both in implementation and in built infrastructure. Um, what I'm seeing here is how does this executive order and all the changes that need to happen, does this give us any of uh, our businesses or government agencies an opportunity to kind of leap forward, overcome some of our challenges and be ahead of the game in anything that we're working on right now? Um, so Raja, do you have any programs that you think are unique to the Department of IT in New Mexico that maybe are would be leading the way versus uh, any of your peers? You're on mute, Raja. Thank you. Um, so definitely we are working on some of the programs. Uh, the state um, is uh, working on developing some cloud policies so that we have a more structured approach to moving to cloud. Um, uh, very similar to the feds, it, it, we would be taking a more cloud smart approach and more data centric or data sensitivity related approach to what is being moved to the cloud and we will have control framework much more defined so that we understand what is it involved in protecting that information if it is 
um, in Jeopardy, right? So those are some of the things that we are working on. So that's cloud. And then we are working on uh, looking at ways to improve the reporting, right? Um, so we have a central um, uh, portal uh, for vulnerabilities, very similar to that, you know, what are some of the things that we can leverage so that we have a central reporting mechanism so that we can report on statistics much more easier because you need to understand the state operates in a very federated model, right? The individual agencies may have their own IT staff and then my function sits on top overarching provide, you know, compl uh, providing compliance security and uh, some level of assurance over uh, the controls. So uh, definitely there are things that we are uh, currently working on in terms of improving the reporting structure. Um, we are also working on doing a risk assessment, uh, much more um, comprehensive risk assessment so that we can have a mechanism and have a GRC solution in place so that we can minimize audit fatigue for many of these agencies so that we can standardize the controls and then um, have the a validation documented in one uh, central location so that agencies can um, uh, minimize some of the audit fatigue. So those are some of the things that we are currently planning to work on. Um, yeah. Thank you, Raja. So I want to take advantage of having uh, Matthew here. We don't often have people that work in the medical industry on these panels. Um, and I want to ask, does this executive order of all the changes that it brings out, you know, we a lot of people don't think of medical devices as being hackable, unless you work in a hospital and you're standing around in that kind of unique tech space or tech environment. Um, we just don't realize the risks that are in those devices. We're all going to use some of those devices at some point in time. You're going to end up in a hospital strung up to a piece of equipment at some point in your life. So uh, while it may not be every day to day um, something you interact with, the risks that exist there are significant. So I'd like to hear from Matt um, if there's anything in this executive order that has a significant impact to how medical devices or the industry there will secure those products. So this is an interesting question for uh, for a few reasons. So. Parts of, of the medical device industry have been at the forefront and experienced the most growing pains when it comes to device security. Um, so uh, a, a lot of the proposed or suggested security requirements that are discussed in the executive order were actually already topics of discussion or have already been implemented to some degree in, in medical device manufacturing. Um, so SBOM, for example, uh, this was first mentioned by the FDA in their pre-market cybersecurity guidance as far back as um, 2016, I believe it was. Um, and then incident reporting uh, has been a requirement of HIPAA as well as the FDA for a, a number of years. And, and I think a lot of hospitals are, are very familiar with the potential implications that, that come from you know, having to be able to uh, make the published, public disclosures around that. Um, I think it will come as a big surprise to some medical device manufacturers, though. I think things in the executive order are, are going to kind of uh, uh, surprise them because if, if you make a medical device and if you want to sell it to the largest customer in the United States, which is the VA, um, you know, you're going to fall subject to this kind of uh, some, some of these more stringent requirements that, that exist there. And um, a lot of device manufacturers um, have not necessarily taken cybersecurity as seriously because they always thought that their particular device couldn't or, or wouldn't be uh, targeted by attackers because it didn't have a network connection or um, there wasn't what was previously perceived as an at a viable attack vector. And in addition to that, um, hospitals have always been kind of a off limits thing when it comes to, to hacking. Um, bad guys have typically stayed away from it because uh, uh, maybe some kind of base moral code that exists with, with hospitals. Uh, but I think we've actually seen that drop away. Um, uh, I think that ransomware uh, doesn't care where you are if it's if the if the infection is via a worm, it, it will um, uh, it'll attack the MTA, it'll attack BART, it'll attack a hospital. And um, I've I've worked directly with hospitals before that have had incidents with with things like ransomware, and um, it is. 
uh, it's a very, very scary situation. Um, as some of the p folks here might, might not realize, but uh, you know, a ventilator or a, a dialysis machine or, or some of these other components that, that are used in hospitals sometimes run Windows. Um, I, I've worked on MRIs that use Windows XP. Um, there's a lot of this equipment is, is a lot more accessible from an attacker perspective than people might realize. And so I think what's going to happen is the executive order is really going to accelerate, I think, some of the deadlines that the FDA has already started to try and encourage people to be moving towards. Um, the, the new director of cybersecurity at the FDA, Kevin Fu, uh, who is, has always been a huge proponent of cybersecurity. He is considered the very first uh, pacemaker hacker. Um, and, and so his uh, particular stance um, is, and I don't know, I haven't talked to him about this, just to preface, but uh, my expectation is that it will be more aggressive. And this executive order, when it came out, the FDA had a publication that stated, we are very encouraged by this. We are excited to see uh, these requirements be pushed down more globally. And uh, we hope to see this uh, taken and adopted by uh, more of the community. Yeah, I would agree with that statement. Many of the medical devices, because uh, because of the cost, right? They, they don't get them replaced on a frequent basis. They are very expensive machines. And uh, Windows XP, I would say Windows 95 are still operating some of the X-ray and MRI machines, right? Uh, so it is a huge risk. I think I, I can remember it's 2018 or 2019 orange worm. Uh, rings a bell, right? You know, that basically said that went in and updated or, you know, impacted 39% of the medical devices that's out there. So uh, it is a huge concern, but, you know, uh, Matthew's right. You know, if you're going to be part of the supply chain to supply one of the largest uh, medical equipment procurement uh, organization in the world, um, unfortunately, you have to follow these uh, executive orders to to improve your security. But I can tell you that's going to require immense amount of development effort and, and um, uh, your testing efforts and quality assurance because we need to know, because Windows issues patches on a regular basis with Windows 10, right? We get updates every other uh, Tuesday or you know my, my monthly Tuesdays and whatnot. So the, that equipment should be in a place to be uh, tested, evaluated, and be in a position to receive those patches on a regular basis. So this is a whole new ball game for health industry and uh, good luck to them. Yeah, and then add, I'd, I'd say too, add complexity of, of how healthcare is becoming more distributed. Um, telehealth and all of the all those complexities with, you know, potentially using uh, people's Wi-Fi, uh, you know, because they're going to the home. I mean, there's so many things to consider with this. And then, like I said, you just throw on distributed healthcare out of the mix and it really adds to the complexity. Yeah, you've got situations now, which is great for the patient and I'm sure great for the caregiver that a person could go home, but they have to have a device that's reporting information back to their doctor after, you know, surgery recovery or something like that. And that's a fairly invasive device giving that information. Um, so it's it's not trivial and we're, we're blending, like you say, that dis distribution blends the risk environment from I'm in this secure building that is a hospital. <laughs> well, not anymore, <laughs> right? Um, and this device is also connected to something that maybe is keeping me alive. So so I'm really concerned with that. Um, I'm sure that the, that equipment that's going to come to your house now is probably not operating on those old Windows platforms, but I can say I've personally seen uh, a piece of equipment in a doctor's office boot up with that Windows XP screen and bounce the little X, you know, Windows thing around. And I just thought, oh, what is this? You know, <laughs> so it's there for sure. Um, well, we're, we're running out of time. Uh, I think we've covered all the questions that we had from the audience. We've definitely covered all the questions that I had prepared for the panel today. So we'll just take the last couple of minutes and do a, a parting words kind of opportunity for the panel. Uh, if there's anything in the executive order that we didn't cover that you think is important for our audience or any impact that you think is going to be uh, critical that we need to respond to, please share that with us. And we'll start with Orion. I yeah, know this is a great, great start. Um, you know, we're kind of trying to get our handle on just what this really means. I, I feel like we really 
could have been here, you know, a couple of weeks ago, but, but that's okay. We're, we're doing what we deal with what we got. So I think at the, at the state level, there's tons of complexities. And like I was saying before, we just really, I mean, I encourage, you know, especially small businesses to, to consider uh, working together to try to come up, come up with solutions. Um, and that, that, that's, that's all I have. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thanks, Ryan. Um, Matthew, go ahead. So um, I, I think these kinds of discussions, the, like kind of what, what Orion just said, is going to be critical. Um, I, I think that when executive orders come out, unless it directly affects an individual, most people just completely ignore what, what, what is stated there. And it is going to be absolutely critical for all of us to disseminate this information as much as we possibly can, especially to our business communities, because some of them may have absolutely wonderful ideas. They want to tackle new and interesting things. They want to, they want to do this stuff. And if they want to sell to the largest players in these spaces, which are oftentimes the local, state, or, or federal governments, um, making sure that they are armed with the knowledge about this, about these types of requirements, what it means is not only going to be good for them to be able to have their business flourish, but it's going to be good for the overall security of our communities in general. Um, almost every single company these days, unless uh, you know you are uh, you know selling gumballs, um, you're in some way connected to a technology that is potentially going to be reached in this manner. Um, so uh, I just I think these kinds of panels should be public, open. They should happen frequently, and I think it's all of our obligation to make sure that we make uh, that everybody that we know knows about this kind of thing. I totally agree. That's why we're doing it. So uh, Raja, any parting words? Yes, um, um, the the executive order is very specific on certain things. Uh, which will improve the overarching uh, uh, coding best practices, right? Because it kind of enforces you to do or utilize secure development practices. So secure software development lifecycle, you know, used to be a textbook piece, right? And I don't know how many developers use secure development principles in their coding um, mechanism, but now it will be mandated at two here is, uh, I don't know how many people paid attention to it, very similar to Sabine's Oxley, this is gonna make the software developer attest to the integrity of the code, right? Attest to secure development practices. So if you are a development manager, better get your act together, right? Because you will be attesting to the code because this goes back to putting the onus back on the developer so that supply chain integrity issues are addressed, right? So uh, I'll be very um, cognizant of these kind of things, right? As part of my uh, vendor management practices, uh, they, I, I can tell you many of the existing uh, Fortune 500 companies are already integrating these questions into their questionnaire, right? Uh, it has your chief development officer attested to the development practices? I'm like, uh, okay, good luck. Go get that from all your third-party code service providers so that you can do it, right? Uh, so this is going to put some liability risk on them. So I'll leave it at that. Thank you, Raja. Uh, well, I'll go ahead and turn it back over to our NMTC hosts. Um, uh, great panel. Thanks to all of our panel members today, and I very much enjoyed it. And so Mary and Deborah, I'll give it back to you. Thank you. Thanks so much, Dick. Thank you, Matthew, Raja, and Orion for this really great discussion. You know, the New Mexico Technology Council, we're proud to continue to offer this type of, uh, of discussions moving forward um, on behalf of our community partners and our cyber peer group. Thank you for allowing us to continue to offer these great sessions. And on behalf of Deborah Breitfeld, our executive director, did you have anything else to add, Deborah? And also Emily. Well, thank Bennett. you so much. Oh, sorry, Ip and Emily Bennett, our marketing and events coordinator. Thank you so much, all of you, for your great panel discussion and all the information. And to Mary for coordinating and the cybersecurity peer group. So everybody have a great day. Thanks thank for you. having this us. Was, this was recorded and it will be available for sharing as well. So we'll look forward to seeing you guys next month. Yeah, and Rick wants to do the next one in person. 
Let's do it. <laughs> well, our speaker will be Lenny, unless we can get him here in Albuquerque. I believe he's in Atlanta. So we might be doing the next one virtual, but we can think about that for September. Yeah, we can at least have watch parties. Sounds good. Thank you, everyone. Have a great day. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks. Bye.